uh, declares that it is a mani what was happening on the day of Pentecost was a manifestation of what Joel uh, prophesied about. So in verse 16 of Acts chapter 2, it says, so this was after uh, there was a rushing mighty wind that blew in. The tongues of fire came upon the apostles. They began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them all trance. Some people thought they were drunk. Some people were marveling at the fact that they were speaking in languages that they had never learned before. So this is what Peter said in explanation, verse 16. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath blood and fire and vapor of smoke and then let's go to first corinthians chapter 12 verse 5 from verse 5 first corinthians chapter 12 verse 5 okay let's start from verse 4 first corinthians 12 verse 4 it says there are diversities of gifts but the same spirits there are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but it's the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues, but one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. Now, there is a talk, there's a lot of talk about, oh, the manifestations of the Holy Spirit take place as the spirit wills, and it's very true, it's very accurate. We can't force manifestations, but we need to understand that the Holy Spirit is willing <laughs> to bring manifestations. God says, I will pour out my spirits. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Young men shall see visions. I can't give myself a vision, but God said, young men will, will, will have visions. People will have visions. God will give people visions. Not everybody, but certain people will have visions when the spirit chooses and when he allows and when he sees fits. Then he says, I will show wonders. I will show wonders in heaven above, signs in the earth beneath. We've said in the beginning of this lesson that uh, we can put the manifestations of the Spirit of God, the nine manifestations of the Spirit of God into three different categories. So out of those nine, three belongs to the, the three, okay, so the nine gifts can be split into groups of three. Utterance manifestations, power manifestations, revelation manifestations, and they were represented in that prophecy. He said there will be prophecy, there will be visions and dreams, there will be signs and wonders. So power, utterance, and, um, and revelations. So, we've talked about gifts of, uh, pro we've talked about word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and the gift of faith. I said we're going to be following the um, order as we see it in 1 Corinthians 12. So, we've done prof um, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, um, and gift of faith, manifestation of the faith of God. And now we're going to talk about gifts of healing. Gifts of healing is one of the power manifestations. Today we're going to try and talk, also talk a bit about working of miracles, but we're going to start with gifts of healing and you know, dwell on that mainly and then talk about miracles and then maybe in the next lesson we'll continue with miracles. So, um, now to understand manifestations of the gifts of healings, we need to consider healing as a broad topic. You know, it helps to consider healing as a broad topic. Um, first of all, God reveals himself as a healer in the Old Testament. He says, I'm, he told the children of Israel, I am the God that heals you. David said, bless the Lord in Psalm 103. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and do not forget his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. So God is a healer by nature. He has the power to heal, and then he has the will to heal. It's very important to understand the fact that God has the will to heal. He's not indifferent about healing. He wants to heal. He has an appetite for healing. 
Anytime he looks at his broken creation, something in him calls out for restoration. Let things be restored back to the order. Anytime he sees something that is broken or out of order, he wants to restore it back to order. So God is a healer. He has the power to heal. He has the will to heal. Another thing that we should consider is the fact that in the redemption that we have in Christ Jesus, God made provision for healing. Isaiah 53 talks about it, and we see it being referenced also in the New Testament in, in Matthew chapter 8, where the Bible says that Jesus took him, himself took our sicknesses and bore our infirmities. So Jesus is called the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the whole world. But this, it, sickness and disease came because of sin. Hallelujah. So when he took away sin, which is the roots, it took away the consequence as well, which includes sickness and disease. There are many places in scripture where you see the connection between sickness and sin. Sickness and sin. For example, the Bible says, God forgives all our iniquity, he heals all our diseases. Many times in the Old Testament, and even in the New Testament, sometimes um, people's sicknesses, are a direct result of their sins. So people sin and brings opens it up for sickness to come in. Even in the New Testament, that was referenced in the book of James when it says that uh, some people who are sick, they will need to have receive forgiveness so that they could be healed. In the ministry of Jesus, in certain instances, not all instances, he will actually have to forgive people's sins before he could minister healing to them. So there's a connection between sin and sickness. The Bible says just himself took our sicknesses and bore our diseases. And the Bible says, by his stripes we are healed. By his stripes we are healed. So healing is part of our redemption rights. The Bible says that Christ has redeemed us. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. If you go to um, Deuteronomy chapter 28, you will see that a major part of the curse of the law is all manner of sicknesses and diseases. So the believer in Christ can stand on God's word, literally on the promise of God's word, without any special manifestation of the Holy Spirit. You can stand on the promises of God's word and receive healing. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. I would say, I'm not even sure I've ever received healing by laying on hands before. Basically, I've walked in divine health by just standing on God's word. And I've experienced God's power in Different, uh, in different ways, just by standing on God's word. So you can receive healing by standing your ground on God's word. Another thing is that every single believer in Christ can minister healing by the promise and the authority of God's word. The Bible says that uh, Jesus said, whatsoever you demand in my name, that will I do. It says the works that I do, you will do also, and even greater works. He said that to all the disciples. The works that I do, which include healing, you can do also, and even greater works. And he says, whatever you demand in my name, I will do it. That's the promise to every believer in Christ. This says, what, it says, the works that I do, he that believes on me, he that believes on me, the works that I do, not the man, not the apostle, the specially anointed person, he that believeth, the works that I do, shall he do also. Also in Mark chapter 16, in the Great Commission, uh, Jesus said in verse 15, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Verse 17, these signs will follow those who believe. Not the apostles, not the evangelists, hallelujah, not the prophets. These signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. Every believer can cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. Every believer can speak in new tongues. They will take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it will by no means hurt them. If for any reason we are attacked by snakes, wild animals, we can claim immunity from their venom, you know, even if it's a scorpion, you know, or snake venom, or attack, we can receive supernatural protection, believe for supernatural protection, because God is the one sending us on assignments. It's like, is, is, is the missionary's protection. God is telling you, go into the world and preach the gospel. So whatever attacks you, you can actually receive protection from that. And then it says, in the last statement, it says, they will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. You don't have to be called into the healing ministry to heal people. You know, Kenneth Hagin talks about two different people. One was a man, one was a woman. Both of them were never called into the ministry. Uh, 
both of uh, the man was actually a deacon in the church and he had he would go to people's houses whenever they were sick they didn't have a pastor then and they would go to people's houses and he would sit down and open scriptures to them and read scriptures to them and when he feels comfortable when he feels that his faith is at a level he will pray for them and he said in almost in all those cases the men will get healed and then he talked about a certain woman as well that he knew same thing she will go to people's houses whenever they are sick and spend time just reading scriptures to them encouraging them with the word and she won't go straight away to just pray for them she will pray with them open the scriptures and then when she's ready she'll pray for them and he said he never heard of a case of anyone not getting healed when this man prayed for you and he said this woman had better results than pastors and evangelists <laughs> but it was almost like a, a a more shall i say labored way like she'd sit down with you and spend time with you sharing the word with you until she felt that your faith was a certain level and you'll get results and even ken taking himself gave personal example with his own personal life that before he started speaking in tongues before he had a healing anointing on him that was the same way he would minister to people because he had been healed by standing on god's word when he was paralyzed and left for dead and he stood on god's word by studying scriptures he just realized that i mean you could re people that jesus healed in the um in the gospels he would ask them would, that, would you be made whole do you know i mean and by faith they could receive healing. So he released his faith in the word of God in Mark 11, 23. And he was able to receive healing without anyone praying for him. Without a special manifestation of the Holy Spirit. He just by standing on God's word, he received healing. So when he was a young pastor, 17-year-old guy, you understand? He was a pastor of a church at the age of 17. He'd go to people's houses when they were sick and read scriptures to them. And after reading scriptures to them, he said sometimes he would spend the whole night with them. And he would pray for them and they will get healed. Later, he started to experience the healing anointing, whereby he didn't have to spend hours reading scriptures to people. He would just lay hands on them and he would feel the power of God go out on him and get them healed. So, we can receive healing by faith personally from God's word. We can administer healing by faith. Now, let's also look at this scripture in James chapter 5, verse 14. Another proof that we can minister healing by faith. Um, it says, Verse 14 of James chapter 5. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Verse 15. And the prayer of faith. Do you see that? And the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avail much so you can minister healing just by faith now we said manifestations of the spirit are called the bible says it actually as the spirit wills but we also say the spirit is always willing to manifest himself one way or the other we don't control how and when but we believe that the Holy Spirit always wants to manifest himself. So what we do is that we stay sensitive. We learn, because the Bible says that we should, concerning spiritual gifts, I don't want you to be ignorant. We learn. We learn how does he manifest himself, how to flow with him, how to yield with him. And the Holy Spirit can bring about these peculiar manifestations. Now, having said all that, everybody qualifies to have any manifestation of the Holy Spirit in their life. Anybody qualifies. But we also know from scriptures and from experience that certain people have more of a particular type of manifestation of the Holy Spirit occurring in their life. For example, we know apostles, prophets, evangelists tend to have gifts of healings. And some, in some cases, working of miracles happening in their life. More often, we know that um, many, in many instances, prophets, pastors um, will have things like um, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, or tongues and interpretation of tongues happening in their life on a more consistent basis. So most of the time, when people have, and when they, whenever there's a gift, we're going to teach about gifts as well. Whenever there's a gift a person have in terms of a calling or an assignment, there tends to be manifestation, a frequency of manifestations in that area that aid that operation. 
So, um, so I said that to say this. Even if a person is not particularly called to the healing ministry, it is very possible that he or she may have a manifestation of the gift of healing whenever the Spirit of God deems fit. And it's also possible to have a unique type of the manifestation of the gift of healing, like not the regular type, a unique type of it. We're going to talk about that. Um, and you will see that in the ministry of Jesus, he didn't always minister healing the same way. There was a default way by which he ministered. And there were some peculiar ways in some peculiar instances by which he also ministered. Now, let's address a bit of, um, let's go to 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28. I want to address another reference to the gift of healing, which is different to what we read earlier in 1 Corinthians, in, um, in 1 Corinthians 12, what was the first one we read? It was in 1 Corinthians 12, verse um, 9. Now we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28. So in 1 Corinthians 12, verse 28, it says, And God has appointed these in the church, first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, after that, miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Okay, now the context in which gifts of healings is used in verse 28 is not referring particularly to a manifestation of God's healing power is referring to an individual who carries a gift, an endowment to minister healing as a calling or an assignment. Do you understand what I'm saying here? So because it puts healing here, gift of healing here, in the category of apostles. Who are apostles? Men and women who are gifted to function in the apostolic ministry. Then it talks about prophets. Who are prophets? Men or women who are gifted to operate in the prophetic ministry. It talks about teachers. Who are teachers? Men or women who are gifted to operate in the teaching ministry. Then it talks about miracles. There are men and women who are gifted to operate in the miracle ministry. And there are men and women who are gifted to operate in a healing ministry. You know, it is believed that someone... Um, Catherine Kuhlman, actually many people, but Catherine Kuhlman, obviously because you're spectacular, had the gifts of healings. You understand? Many people. And when you say the gifts of healings, many people with the gifts of healing combining with other ministries. For example, many evangelists combine having the evangelistic ministry with the gifts of healing. Many apostles combine having gifts of healings with their ministry as apostles or evangelists some cases, teachers of the word of God. Some cases, prophets of God's word. They also have that gift of healing. So they are a healing ministry plus other things they do. Now, um, usually when people have a healing ministry or they have a, what I call the gift of healing as a calling and an assignment, they tend to have the healing anointing. Okay? The healing anointing. And I'm going to show you evidence from the word. Many things we learn about um, the operations and manifestations of the Holy Spirit, we learn by experience, by people who have experienced it, because there's a peculiarity to it. The word of God doesn't give us an exhaustive teaching of every single thing. But we can see examples, and then we can also learn from experience how the Spirit of God operates and manifests himself in peculiar ways. So some things I may say that may not necessarily be explicitly taught in the word, but are gleaned from people's experiences who have had those encounters with the Holy Spirit. Because even the Bible tells us that everything that Jesus did was not recorded. You understand? The Bible is a book, where, is a book that gives us instructions about day-to-day -day living. It doesn't give us an exhaustive teaching of how the Holy Spirit operates. Okay? Now, Healing anointing. What is the healing anointing? It is, a, it is a dimension of God's power that 
operates basically uh, for healing the sick, for restoring people's bodies back to wholeness and soundness. I'm not going to teach, spend much, much time speaking on the healing anointing. I'm just going to talk about it briefly and kind of like, shall I say, distinguish it from the gifts of healing. So, the healing anointing, the way it operates, from what we observe in Scripture, okay? You, can, you won't find the statement I'm about to make in Scripture, but it can be inferred from Scripture. The healing anointing, the way it operates, the, it depends on the measure of healing anointing, or measure of the power presence, and the measure of faith that the minister and the recipient have. Okay? Measure of the power presence, measure of faith the minister and the recipient have. That's what determines how effective the healing anointing is. Let's look at examples of the healing anointing. Um, Luke chapter 5 verse 17. I'm going to read from the New King James Version. Luke chapter 5 verse 17. It says, Now it happened on a certain day, as he was teaching, that there were Pharisees and teachers of, teachers of the Lord sitting by, who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Do you see that? The power of the Lord was... Why does... See, whenever you see Luke emphasize something, it's because he's trying to make a distinction. Is God always present? God is ever present. Why will he say the power of God was present to heal? Because there was a healing anointing in the atmosphere. That was his way of describing the healing anointing. The, we, we are the ones that use the word term healing anointing. It's not found in the Bible. So, he said the power of the Lord was present to heal. But ask yourself, if you start, read that story, only one person got healed in that story. Only one person got healed. And the only person that got healed was the crippled man. And it came because he came believing. The power of God was present to heal. But it was only a person who had faith. You understand? So I'm giving you evidence as why I said earlier, the way the healing anointing works is this. It depends on the measure of power presence and the faith and the, of the recipient and the minister. So the only person that got healed was the person who was in faith. Let's look at another scripture here. In Luke chapter 6, verse 19, it says, And the whole multitude sought to touch him, Luke 6, verse 19. The whole multitude sought to touch him, for power went out from him and healed them all. He says, you will never, this is a peculiar phrase. Power went out from him. One of the things we notice from looking at scripture and from experience is that healing anointing tends to be, can be tangible. In other words, it can be felt. Even though it's a spiritual substance, it can be felt. It says, um, power went out from him and healed them all. In this instance, we, if you look at the story in Luke, 9, Luke chapter 6, he had spent an extended time in prayer. So that extended time in prayer meant that there's an intensity in the concentration of the power of God in that area. So we, we said that the way the healing anointing works is this. The, the intensity of the power, the measure of the power, combined with the faith of the recipient and the one ministering. So here it says the power was flowing, most likely because there was a lot of time spent in prayer. It was very intense. It was easy for the people to plug in by faith to receive the healing, healing anointing. And then in Luke chapter 8, verse 43, we're going to look at the case, the story of the woman with the um, issue of blood. It says, um, verse 43, it says, Now a woman having a flow of blood for 12 years who had spent all her livelihood on physicians and could not be healed by any came from behind and touched the border of his garment and immediately the flow of her blood stopped. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all the night, Peter and those with him said, Master, the multitude throng and press you. And you say, Who touched me? But Jesus said, Someone touched me for I perceive power going out from me. Do you see that? I perceive power going out from me. We said it can be felt. So the multitude were touching Jesus. And I can guarantee you, among those touching Jesus, there were probably other sick people touching Jesus. But only one person got it. And Jesus said, thy faith has made you whole. Even though the Bible testifies that power, he himself said, power went out from me, 
He didn't say it was my power that healed you. He said your faith made you whole. Now was your faith made the difference? Others were touching him, but it was our faith that made the difference. So when it comes to the healing anointing, faith is involved. Faith is involved. It can heal anybody, but faith is involved. Okay? Are you following me? Now let's go. So now let's talk about the gifts of healing. First of all, you will notice that the word gifts is in plural. Okay? And even the word healing is in plural. Gifts of healings. Gifts of healings. So, this is, this is how it boils down to. You can have different types of healings take place. And you can have different ways by which the power operates. Let's go to Matthew chapter 21, verse 14. Matthew chapter 21, verse 14. We don't have too many source material to explain this, but we have some in Scripture. There are times when a person can have specific gifts for particular types of sicknesses. And you will see it in scripture here. So, it says in verse 14 of Matthew 21, this was when Jesus went to the temple. Um, after he, you know, he rode on the donkey, what we call Palm Sunday, he went to the temple, he drove out the money changers and all that. And then he went to the temple. It says, then the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. Do you see that? Blind and lame. Blind and lame. They came to him and he healed them. Why? Why does he only specify two categories of people? I'm sure there were other people that had other things there. Blind and lame. Let me explain something to you. So, around 1900s, in the 1900s, when we had what was called to some, what, 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 1904 was when we now had what they called the Azusa Street Revival, when there was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and there came like a resurgence of um, the gifts of the Spirit. And there was a lot of people started to move in the healing anointing. And then you now had in the night, from 1948 as well, you had what it was called the healing revival. Lots of people were moving in the gifts of healing, you know. So, Kenneth Hagin said he, he, he had some conversation with fellow ministers. And then they were, they were talking about their experiences in ministry. One particular person said, oh, that it seemed like he, he, he mostly gets blind people healed. One person said, I've never gotten a blind person healed, but I've never seen a deaf person I prayed for not get healed. You understand what I'm saying? And then Kenneth Hagin began to take stock of his own ministry and realized that in his own case, when it came to tumors, ruptures, and you know, he had like, he said he had over 90% results. That was where he had his most success. You understand? It was the easiest thing for him to get people with tumors <coughs> and ruptures healed. You understand? So he began to look closely into this, talking with different people, and he realized that that was the case with many people. They had like, it was as if they had their specific type of um, sickness that they were very good at ministering to. You understand? There was a particular man, the guy who wrote the book Christ the Healer, um, F.F. Boswell. His own was ears. Anything that has to do with your ears. Whether you have a, in fact, there were instances whereby if people that don't have a, an eardrum, he will pray for you, you have a new eardrum. He seldom did not get any person with an ear problem healed. Deaf, completely deaf, partially deaf, he'll just pray for you and get, get, he'll get, he'll get you healed. That was like his gift. You understand? Now, you look at this instance here. It says, the blind and lame came to him. Why did they come to him? Is it possible, even though we don't have evidence of it in Scripture, is it possible that he requested specifically for those people to come to him? Do you understand what I'm saying? It's possible that he actually said, if you're blind, if you're lame, come here. Now, usually, when you have this manifestation, it's easier to get people healed. You know, I mentioned that with the healing anointing, you need people's faith. 
in the people's faith. When the Bible says that when Jesus went to his hometown, he could there do no mighty works except pray for a few people. You understand? Because there was limits. People's lack of faith limited his ability to minister. Now, one thing I've noticed that could, and I'm speculating here, the reason why God gives this special gift of healing is to help the faith of others. When the man of God says, if you're blind, come here. If you're lame, come here. And you see them instantly healed. Usually, most people's their faith easily rises. For example, the woman with the issue of blood. Bible says she had heard. She had heard of Jesus' healing power. So it was easy for her to summon her faith and say, hey, if I touch them of his garment, I'll be made whole. Because of what she has heard. You know, people in the world say seeing is believing. So usually, what God will do is that he will gift an evangelist or someone who has the healing, healing anointing with a special anointing to heal specific types of sicknesses or diseases. It could be a blind person. So imagine if in a particular town, everybody knows the local blind man and the local lame man, and then the evangelist comes to town and he gets him healed because he has the gift of healing and also the gift of healing in the area of blindness and lame, and healing the lame. And everybody's like, wow, 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 he's, he's a healer. And then everybody gathers to the crusade and they are ready to receive God's healing power. Now, because he has the healing anointing, he can heal everybody else who has faith. But the reason why they have faith it was because the blind was healed, the lame was healed. You understand what I'm saying? Let's look at this. Acts chapter 8. We're going to start from verse 4. Acts chapter 8, verse 4. This is the story of um, Philip. Philip was one of the original 12 deacons. So Philip was a deacon initially. And we found out later in the book of Acts that he became an evangelist. He was called Philip the Evangelist. So this was probably the start of his evangelistic ministry. So verse 4 of Acts chapter 8. Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere, preaching the word. Of the, preaching the word. Verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip. They paid attention to him. He says, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Do you see that? Hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Now, what did he do? For unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. Do you see that? Many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. What about those who were blind? What about the deaf? What about those who had maybe cancer or fever? He says, many who were blind and lame, sorry, who were paralyzed and lame, were healed. And he says, verse 9, but there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom, whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with sorcery for a long time. But when they believed Philip as he preached the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were believed. Then Simon himself also believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and signs that were done. Philip came to that town and it came like a storm, like a hurricane. Everybody was swept away. The Bible says there was great joy in that city. Everybody was caught up with what he was saying. And he didn't have to... So um, one day I, I try to imagine my I imagine Philip's journey. Why did he choose Samaria? So I'm like, before you can understand why, you have to understand his what was he known for before then? He was known as a man who was full of the spirits. Because that was why he was chosen as a deacon in the first place. So here's a man who prioritizes the spirit. He lives under the influence of the Holy Spirit. So for him to have chosen Samaria as a Jew, it should not have been his natural instincts. Because he's a Jew. He was raised to consider the Samaritans as inferior to him. So for him to have gone to Samaria must have been impressed upon him by the spirits. Okay? So he goes to Samaria because the spirit of God leads him. And then he starts to preach. What? Him coming to Samaria, why would they have accepted him? Because God had to use something that would capture their attention. You understand what I'm saying? What could have captured their attention? Imagine if you walked up to a lame man, a paralyzed man, and he prayed for the man, and the man was healed. Definitely they'll take they'll take they'll pay attention to him. 
Now, that person he was praying for probably never had faith. They didn't even know it was possible for him to get healed. So it couldn't have been that man's faith. So God had to put on, um, manifest through, what's his name, um, Philip, a special gift of healing, a, gift, a, a manifestation of the gift of healing, whereby it could heal people who were lame or paralyzed without them having to exercise their faith. So that usually is the purpose of the gift of healing, to stir up the faith of others. So he goes there, starts to heal every cripple, every lame person, and cast out demons from people. You understand what I'm saying? And then everybody starts to pay attention to him, listen to him, and all that stuff like that. And then next thing, other miracles start to happen. And the gospel spreads across the land. So I personally believe that that's... So Evidently, everything God does, it does it because of love. So obviously, God does it because of love. Also, to help the faith of men. Because God ultimately wants people to exercise faith. So he will do things that will cause men to believe, so that by believing, they can receive the fullness of what he has for them. So that's why we can have specific gifts of healing that are targeted towards certain sicknesses and diseases, so that it can help the faith of the multitudes when they see instant manifestations of the miraculous in the area of healing people's bodies. Now, another interesting thing is this. When it comes to the gifts of healing, because, like I said, the word gift is in, is in plural. The word healings is also in plural. It's in that there are also specific, unique ways by which it may operate. So when you look at the ministry of Jesus, you know that if, you ask, if I ask you to, any one random person, what was Jesus' default way of ministering healing? Can anyone guess that answer? What was his default way of ministering healing? Like 9 out of 10, this is how he's going to minister healing. Of course he was laying hands. Of course. You see, say, the multitude came, he laid hands on them. You understand what I'm saying? That was like his default way. In fact, I remember when um, Jairus' Jairus came to meet him. He said, come and lay your hands on my daughter. Why? Because that's what he does. He will lay hands on multitudes. Like if a thousand people came, he laid hands on a thousand people. <laughs> that was the normal way he would minister. Now, in some, on, on, like in the time we read in um, Luke 6, they touched him and they got healed. But his default way of ministry was lay hands. Now... What you will now see in scripture was that in certain instances, certain instances, he won't lay hands. Um, let's look at this in John chapter 9, verse 6. So, what happened in John chapter 9 initially was that there was a man who was blind from his birth, and they asked him, How was this? What, 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 what made this man blind? Was he his sins or his parents' sins? And Jesus said that the works of God may be manifest in him. He said, I must walk the works of him that sent me, the light, night coming where no man can walk. So in verse 6, he says, When I said these things, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva, and he anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated sin. So he went and washed and came back saying, He spat on the ground, made spit, put it in his eyes, go and wash. You understand? Sorry? You say what? Yeah, but it, it, it took spits. And, um, and, and clay. You understand what I'm saying? So he's laying hands plus. Did, did he really lay hands? He anointed his eyes. That's what he says. Or there was a story in um, Second Kings, verse 5. Uh, Naaman, the Syrian, uh, was he a general? But it was a Syrian soldier that had leprosy. And he came to Israel. To, he heard his, his servant girl was in Israel, um, was an Israelite, and she t she mentioned to her the wife of Naaman that there's a prophet who could heal him in Israel. And he went to Israel seeking Elijah. Elijah even was it Eli I think it was Elisha. Was it Eli yeah, Elisha. Elisha refused to come out to see him. He just told him go and wash seven times in the Jordan. That's why he told him go and wash in the Jordan seven times. And initially, was, he felt insulted. Because like, he, he obviously did not like the Jordan River. He thought, <laughs> why should I go? That's like, he felt like it was beneath his dignity to wash in the Jordan River. But his servants convinced him to act on the instruction of the prophet. And he went and 
The Bible says he dipped himself seven times in the Jordan and his skin was like brand new. All the leprosy was gone. You understand? So that was a specific, a unique operation of the gift of healing. It wasn't the regular lay hands and be healed. It was a specific gift of healing. Um, there was an instance in Mark 7 when a man who was deaf, you know, was brought to Jesus. He says, they begged him to put his hands on him. Do you see that? Um, sorry, I didn't give you the chapter and the verse. Mark 7, verse 32 um, to 33, sorry, to 34. Then they brought to him one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. And they begged him to put his hand on him. Why were they begging him to put his hands on him? Because that's how he heals people. They've seen how he heals people. He lays hands on them. But look at what he did to him. Verse 33. He took him aside from the multitude, put his fingers in his ears. Stuck his finger in his ear. He didn't lay hands on him. Of course, you could say, well, sort of he did. But he put his fingers in his ears and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephata, that is, be open. That's how he healed the man. Put his finger in his, in his ears, spat and touched his tongue. Put his hand in his mouth. <laughs> Don't ask me about the germs and all that stuff, but he did that. And the man was healed. Now, why did he do that? Because he was following the Holy Spirit. So let's, let's talk about contemporary times. You know, can I think you said one time a woman came to him and it was like she was pregnant. She had cancer of the stomach. So it looked like she was pregnant. And just like most healing ministers, he's, the way the anointing worked with him was by laying on of hands. So he laid hands on a woman to minister healing to her. And then God said to him, punch her stomach. And he's like, okay. <laughs> Hold on, God. He said, if I punch her stomach, I need to explain. He said, no, I think initially he just, said, he just ignored it. Like, nah, I'm not going to punch her stomach. Because he's used to laying hands on people and they're getting healed. And he said, when he ignored it, he said he felt like the anointing lifted off him. So he, he apologized to God. He said, okay, God, let the anointing come back on me so I can minister to her. So he had to explain to everybody that this is what God told me. Like, it's not like I want to hit her, <laughs> but so God told me. And he said he punched the woman's stomach. He said he, um, the cancer instantly disappeared. Her stomach, in fact, he said her address went down. Like... What happened? Where did he go? He said, I don't know. <laughs> he punched the stomach and boop, thing went off. That was a manifestation of the gift of healing. And it was a peck, it was a different, like, like almost like it was a manifestation for that moment. That's not how he ministers. You understand what I'm saying? But at that point in time, that was how the Holy Spirit wanted him to minister. So those kind of things can happen, whereby if you're following the Spirit, you will have a manifestation apart from the usual healing anointing that you may have or the usual manifestation of the gift of healing that you may have. Because he actually had, seemed to have a gift of healing in the area of cancers and tumors and all that. But there was a different operation. And you have to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit to respond to however he wants to move through you. Now, Kenneth said he knew a man who, if you came to him for healing, he would spit in his hands and lay hands on you. And he said he never saw anyone not get healed. If that man ministered to you that way, he would spit in his hands, doop, doop, and rub it and heal you and minister pray for you. But he said, as gross as that was, he said he never saw anyone not get healed. Whatever the man prayed for them. Yep. So that was, that was his gift of healing. Now, there was also Smith Wigglesworth. Smith Wigglesworth was also someone who punched a lot. Not all the time, interestingly. It wasn't all the time. Now, some people, the way they talk about it, they seem as if, make it seem as if he was, was always punching people. But it wasn't all the time. But a lot of time, more than, now, Kenneth Higgins said he's had to punch people when, he, when the book of his I read, he said he's had, he's had to punch people about three. In his own, like, 40 years of ministry then, maybe like three or four times, having to punch people or slap people or so. But um, Wigglesworth did it many times. Like, people are healed. He was, mm. There was a time he punched a guy 
And the guy slumped. They thought he was dead. He said, they said, you've killed him, you've killed him. We're going to sue you. He said, no, nah, he's healed. And he walked away. He didn't even check to see whether the guy was going to recover. He, goes, he said, he's healed and walked away. And then the guy got up. The guy had cancer too. The guy got up and there he was, completely healed. You understand? So there are peculiar gifts. The Holy Spirit will move it. And he usually, like Kanegi said, he noticed that whenever the Spirit of God moves in those peculiar ways, they usually instant or faster. You understand? So it's like the Holy Spirit wants to bring a, like the gift of healing seems to require little faith to operate. And it seems to work faster. You understand what I'm saying? And it, I think the, the stated goal is to actually help the faith of the multitudes to see that they can actually receive their healing. Because it usually does not come to heal the entire multitude. It's usually specific instances or specific sicknesses. Do you understand what I'm saying? Now, I like to, whenever I teach on the gifts of the Spirit, I like to teach people practical ways by which we can create atmospheres. Because sometimes when we teach it in this... Um, how about it? Academic way. It seems like we're just giving people information and not letting them realize that it's actually within your grasp. It is within your grasp. God is very, the Holy Spirit is very willing. And there are things that people do to actually uh, make such manifestations more accessible. You know, the Bible says the girl shall live by faith. God wants us to live by faith. That's our lifestyle. Now, we can consciously build our faith in such a way that the power gifts of the Spirit are easily accessible to us. Let's look at Psalm 77. We're going to talk about, the, I'm going to mention something about the gift of miracles. And I'm transitioning from healings to miracles now, but I just want to talk about how you can create an atmosphere for the power of God to manifest. Now, David was someone who operated in the miraculous. He operated in miraculous. And there are certain things he did that made that miraculous power easily accessible. It says in Psalm 77 verse 11, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. Do you see that? That was very intentional. I will focus on your miracles. People that operates in the miraculous, this usually is their practice. Daniel was saying, oh, you are a God who reveals secrets. And guess what happened to Daniel? Daniel saw a lot of revelations. That was, he focused on that attribute of God. David here was talking about God's power, God's miracle working ability. And that was what he saw in his life. So I remember back in those days, you know, when, in, 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 when, when um, certain people were going to minister like, uh, minister Tokes, who came here for our anniversary last year. And many other ministers, they'll be like, oh, sing something about healing. And then you start singing songs like, I am the God that healed thee. And it's so easy for miracles to happen because everybody's mind will focus on God's healing ability. I remember listening to Andrew Womack. He said, obviously he has a healing ministry as well. But he said one time he started to as a, like, like, just like a hobby, started studying on, meditating on resurrection, re, um, raising, raising the dead. He started studying on it. And then one time, one a period of like, he felt like, oh, go back to start meditating on raising the dead again. And he was just doing it. And shortly after that, he heard the news that his son died. When he first heard about it, obviously, as any parent would be, he was sad, feeling bad. And he had to drive two hours to go and see his, the body of his son. And he was driving there, you know, trying to encourage himself, you know, trying to just, you know, keep uh, encouraging himself in the Lord, you know. And while he was encouraging himself in the Lord, he just started remembering prophecies that were spoken about his son. And he was like, these prophecies have not yet been fulfilled. How can he die when the prophecies about his life have not yet been fulfilled? And so he said, he switched from encourage yourself, you know, it is well, and like, nope, the boy has to come back to life. He said, when he got to the mortuary, 
because they wanted, out of respect, they wanted him to see his son before. They took, he said he was lying on the table, on the on a wooden, on a steel um, platform, and they had put a tag on his toe already, you know, preparing him for maybe embalming or just put him in the freezer. And he, he said he just got there, laid hands on the boy, and called him back to life. Over two hours of him being dead, the, man, the boy came back to life. But there was an atmosphere. That he, for that two hours of driving to that um, hospital, there was an atmosphere of praise, of expectation, and he had been building his faith along that line. When the Bible says, covet earnestly the best gifts. People who are going to operate in the power gifts of the Spirit, there's a mindset, there's an, a level of expectation that you have to have. You must focus on God's ability and his willingness to heal. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 12, 31 tells us, earnestly desire the best gifts. 1 Corinthians 14 says, pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. And then, in Acts chapter 4, verse 29, this was when they were doing, um, the disciples were being um, threatened by the um, Jewish elders. And they came together, they, talk, they, 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 they began to praise God. And then this was what they said in verse 29. Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal. They turn their desires, their yearning, they, 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 they turn it into prayer. Stretch out your hand. The hand of God is talking about the power of God. They made a demand on the power of God. Stretch out your hands to heal and that signs and wonders. When I said and to heal and signs, in other words, not just healing, prioritize healing, but also signs, other signs and wonders, may be done through the name of your Holy Servant Jesus. They were calling for the power manifestations of the Holy Spirit. Do you see that? You can actually call for specific categories of the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. You can call for revelation if what you need is revelation. Lord, I want to see, I mean, reveal your will to me. You're calling out for revelation. Here they were calling, we want to see power. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's see your power in demonstration so that your word will be, people will take your word seriously because they realize that when people saw God's power, it made them have a deeper reverence for God's word. Do you see that? When they healed the blind, when they healed the cripple, 5,000 people got saved because they were like, wow, this is God. And you see in the journeys of Paul, when he would go to a place and do miracles, he said, the gospel I preach did not come in word only. It came in the demonstration of the spirit and the power of God. So it's actually a strategy for communicating the gospel is to believe God for God's for his power to be made manifest. And then we see in um, Acts chapter 5, um, from verse 12, it says, And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And we saw that multitudes began to gather to the point whereby they couldn't have enough buildings to hold the multitudes. And Peter's shadow was literally healing the sick. Multitudes were healed, even though they were, in, they were literally in the heart of Jewish territory, where preaching the gospel was meant to be legal. But there was so much power in operation that they they were able to get their message across. It gave a reverence to God's word in the heart of men. So, let's talk about miracles. We have four minutes. So we're going to talk about the gift of miracles or working of miracles. Now, another alternative translation of the word working of miracles can also be um, acts of power. Acts of power. Working of miracles. Acts of power. And they come in diverse ways. We're going to take time next week, next week to talk about working of miracles. But let me just talk about creative miracles in the human body. Creative miracles in the human body. Now, some people have missing body parts. Or some people have body parts that are damaged beyond repair. And God can actually replace body parts. Healing carries the idea of restoration. You know that. But you can't restore what was never there before. If it was never there, you can't say, if a person was born without eyeballs, you can't say God healed his eyes. There's, there's nothing to heal. <laughs> he doesn't have any. You understand what I'm saying? And 
you know, I've heard of some weird miracles before. This one, I tell you, you can now research it. A certain man was healed. No, no, he had a miracle in his eyes. He didn't have eyes in his eye sockets. And he was prayed for. And he still didn't have eyes or eyeballs, but he can read from his eye sockets. <laughs> My brother told me about it when I was young. He said he watched a, a, one of these shows. And it, when he told me, when I grew older, I thought it was, it was lying to me. Until I saw it, until I read about it later, I was like, wow, it was actually true. No eyeballs. God prayed for. And he can read. And he can see. Still no eyeballs. <laughs> God does those kind of things. Like, just to show, like, I'm yeah, God. He can see. But he has no eyeballs. Can I think you talk about a, 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 one of his deacons who fell down from a building one time and injured his elbow. His elbow was shattered. And when they prayed for him, x-ray shows that his elbows are still shattered, but hands are in perfect order. He said he was even collecting disability benefits. And he told them, I have perfect use of my hand. I'm back at work. But they say, yeah, the e evidence shows <laughs> that you don't have an elbow. <laughs> so, something, certain times that God does some things that are literally out the logic of it. Let me tell you one story. The founder of AFM in Zimbabwe, you know, AFM Church, John G. Lake, one of my favorites, God's generals. He he was in South Africa for five years, in the early part of the century. So he knew about healing. He believed in healing. But you know, miracles kind of like, it challenges your intellect. Man was very, um, young Lake was very educated, and he believed in God's power. But one time, he, he, he went into his tent, and he saw his, he had his um, assistant, was local. His name was Letwaba. And he was praying for a child. And the child, he looked at the child, he realized that the, the child's neck was broken. He said you could literally turn the child's head 360 degrees. Like, the neck was broken. The child was crying, he fell off his mother's back. And I thought I was like, no, 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 yeah, broken. Was it broken or... The, neck, it was, the, the, the bone, the neck was severed, but the, 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 the neck was still together, the, the skin was still together. And he said... But his assistant could not tell the difference. He said, he said the child has hurt. He was saying it in broken English. The child has hurt his neck. He was like, it's not, the neck is not hurt. The neck is literally broken. So he said he realized that the guy had faith. He didn't have faith. So he left um, the man alone. He said when he came back, he said, let's talk about what happened to the child. He said the child is healed. Completely Jesus has healed the child. He said when he went back there, the child's neck was perfect. Fused. He said, he said, God, any, any form of unbelief in my heart, take it away in Jesus' name. He said, this guy, out of his, due to his lack, his ignorance, he was able to believe for God to fuse the neck back. He didn't even know that the neck was broken. But he, because of his education, he was still like, I don't know, this, <laughs> this is another level. So, miracles are a demonstration of God's power over matter. The Spirit of God, who created the heavens and the earth, he can actually recreate. He can bring matter back together again. Now, can I think you talk about a, a, an instance whereby someone, um, I think, was it, was it, no, it was William Marion Branham, who was also a healing minister, wanted to pray for a woman, and he realized that the woman needed a new body part, and he was having a healing anointing, and I was like, the anointing will heal this woman. So he called her, he called, I think he called Higgins and said, let's agree. Not that let's lay hands, because he knew that I have a healing anointing. You can't heal what is not there. They agreed for a miracle to take place and a miracle to place. The missing body part was restored. There was a story I read one time in um, R. R. Robert's, um, um, one of his books. A woman brought her son who did not have a hip. Obviously, he can't work well. And she brought him to a care, R. R. Robert's to pray. Robert told the woman, he said, I'm sorry, I don't have faith for this. You understand know what I'm saying? That's the man of God. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't have faith for this. Because it was like, there would need to be a, new, a recreation of a new heap. The woman told him, he said, you do the praying, I'll do the believing. 
That's what the woman told him. You do the praying, I'll do the believing. And he said he prayed for her. And he said the child limped away. And he was like, yep, just like I expected. Nothing was going to happen. He said he came to, because he was having a crusade. He came to his crusade the next day. And meeting that started, he was in his um, room praying. And when he came, he had noise. What's going on? The child he prayed for yesterday was run on the stage, giving his testimony. New hip had been created. <laughs> God is a miracle worker. And what I'm trying to say is that these are people who, they had a history of God healing the sick in their ministry. They knew what healing means. Healing means if it was broken, diseased, it can be restored. But they were struggling with creation. And they released their faith and there was a manifestation of miracles, an act of power. God recreated body parts. And I realized that if you are very open to such things, those, you will see more and more of those manifestations. And that's one of the things that God wants us to be, get to the place whereby we are very open to it. Now, there's a mistake that people make. Oh, I'm going to be on my time. There's a mistake that people make. When, the reason why you need to balance yourself out is this. If you're always like, oh, God is going to do miracles anytime I want it, you may find yourself in some predicaments. Like, I had I had a case of some women who decided that they were going to walk on water. Suppose to say, a tragedy happened. They didn't walk on water. It was a flood. They didn't walk on water. They, they died because they expected God to. You understand what I'm saying? So there's a balance to I believe God can do anything. And then, when you believe in, when, when you release your faith for God to do anything, you also have to watch out for what signals he gives to you. You can make the Holy Spirit bring about a manifestation, but you can stay open to the Holy Spirit to receive a manifestation. You understand? Like, if you see someone that is missing a body part, you can pray. It doesn't cost you anything to pray. Right? You can pray and trust God for the miraculous. But when it comes to walking on water, you better hear the voice of God. You better know what God is saying. You understand what I'm saying? Now, if God speaks, if God tells you to, it will happen. I've heard, and we, next week when we talk about, we're going to talk about miracles, I will tell you about people that were walking on water. People that were turning water into wine. Every time they wanted to have communion. Not because they just wanted to do it, but because they didn't have wine. <laughs> They were too poor to have wine, and they believe that for them to have communion, it has to be water. It has to be wine. So they will fetch water and believe it turns to wine, and every time it turns to wine. That was, um, it was in Indonesia. There's a book called Like a Mighty Wind. If you want to read those books, you can go and get it. But I think it's getting scarce now on, 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 the, on Amazon. But we got some copies of it, Like a Mighty Wind. There was a lot of miracles that took place. We're going to talk about it next week, Wednesday. Let's get up on our feet. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for what you're doing in this day and in this time. We stay, choose to stay open and receptive to the work of your spirits. And we believe for the miraculous, Heavenly Father. We believe for the miraculous. We believe for your hand to be stretched forth to heal and to perform signs and wonders to the glory of your name. In the name of Jesus. Amen.